Electricity, I think, is an underestimated player in the detox uh, game, in the detox world. It's overlooked. And there are a lot of things we can certainly do to detox, you know, but you'll detox better if you have enough electrons to do it. Hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Myers. Welcome to the Myers Detox Podcast. Today, we have a special treat for you. My friend Spencer Feldman is on the show. This is such a good podcast. We talk about how to detoxify with electrons. And Spencer Feldman is the founder of RemedyLink.com. He's, he's a, it's a detox website. He has a whole line of detox supplements, and he's incredibly knowledgeable about the body and what can impede detoxification. So today our topic is electrons. So what electrons are, how they, how we get them, and how we lose them. More importantly, we talk about grounding versus electrons versus voltage in the body. Uh, we talk about how low electrons inhibit our ability to detox. And we also discuss how polluted air is stealing electrons from the air, which then steals electrons from our lungs. Uh, air used to be a way that provided a lot of electrons to our body. Now it steals them. The electrons from raw food. And we talk about how low electrons can cause crystals to form in our bodies like gout, kidney stones, and oxalate, and how to break up these crystals in the body. So really good show today, really juicy. And so I know you guys listening to this show are concerned about your body burden of heavy metals and, you know, curious what metals you may have. So I created a really easy quiz for you to take at heavymetalsquiz.com. Just takes a couple of minutes. And after Spencer, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yes. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you became so passionate about detox? Personally, you know, I was a mid forcep birth, so my head got kind of crushed coming out. And uh, like most people got vaccinated. Then, you know, uh, I think I had acne as a kid and uh, the doctors put me on some drugs that are now called uh, black box drugs because uh, they have <laughs> suicide risks associated with them. Um, you know, most of uh, you know, the drug I was on, it was called Accutane and the people I know who've been on it, a lot of them have actually gone kind of, kind of crazy. Uh, it definitely messes with the brain. You know, the body has an ability to um, bounce back from insults, uh, but uh, some people get enough insults that you know, they kind of fall into a place where they can't maintain homeostasis anymore and things start to fall apart. So, you know, my body started uh, falling apart um, and, and it, I'm still learning how I was damaged, um, mostly by the medical establishment. I mean, as an example, I had some gaps between my teeth when I was young, which my mother thought didn't look good. So she got braces put on me. And what that did is it shoved all the teeth in the front back in, braces will do this, right? Braces are contractive. They'll bring the teeth closer together for some people. And that means you, for me, the lower jaw had to go backwards to close, uh, which meant that you did, I didn't sleep well for the last 30 years, um, which has all sorts of consequences. And, you know, that's not something I ever really knew. I knew I didn't feel you know, you know, like I had lots of energy when I woke up, but I thought that was normal. And then I got this thing called an aura ring that you put on your finger. It's one of these many sleep tracker devices. And it said I was basically getting zero deep sleep. I'm like, well, that's not good. That's, that's where you, you know, create memories and, you know, um, you know, like where your brain repairs. So now I'm at age 52, I'm going to have to go get braces again. And this time have it done to un do what the braces did to me when I was 12 and put my teeth back the way they were. Wow, so, you know, really? Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, here I am 52 thinking, okay, I've got this all figured out, I, you know, and then I find one other thing that I've been living with for 30 years that I find I haven't been sleeping properly. So, you know, if you're a, a hacker for your body, um, you know, there's, there's, even if you're in the industry, there's still things you're going to keep learning that, you know, weren't necessarily working right for you. One of the ones that I was sort of hacking with years ago, and we talked about this was electrons. Uh, you know, I read this book on grounding 
And I said, wow, that's really amazing. The, the science looks um, fascinating. Uh, what's that all about? And you know, what I found out as I kind of delved a little bit more deeply into it is that there are things that the body has to have. And you can kind of do workarounds for some of them and some of them you can't. So you have to get sunlight. Uh, a workaround is vitamin D3. But, you know, sunlight does more than just create vitamin D. It has a lot of effects on the body. The infrared helps create structured water. Um, you know, it disinfects. It does lots of things. So, yes, you can take and should take um, vitamin D3, especially uh, with what's going on in the world now. But that's not a, a way to supplant or replace the sunlight. Um, it's the same for water, you know. The body does not expect us to be in a desert, right? We're not, we're not desert creatures. Uh, we evolved, some people say, uh, near the oceans. Um, you know, human population is mostly either on the oceans or along rivers, if you look at the planet. So the body has an expectation of water. So we don't have the ability to store water very well. And if you get dehydrated, it's gotta be a problem pretty darn fast. Um, we do have the ability to store calories. So uh, for instance, I do a fast once a year. Um, I think the last fast I did a couple of months ago was 14 days. And you know we should probably talk about fasting one day because it's really one of the most amazing protocols you can do and it's completely free. But so the body has an ability to store calories. That's what body fat is. And uh, you know some animals also have the ability to go even further and go into hibernation. So there are some things the body can store. You can store some B12. You know, you can store um, the fat soluble vitamins, don't store vitamin C very well, which is why, you know, people would get scurvy uh, on sea voyages before they understood to, you know, to bring sauerkraut or, or fermented things with them or lemons. Well, one of the things we can't store is we can't store electrons. The body has an expectation that electrons are always going to be available, just like water. And at least in the case of water, there are places you can go and you can go to your local waterfall. You, you can, you know, get water and boil it. You can capture rainwater and cisterns. So historically, not only was there a lot of water um, available, but you could to some degree store some of it externally. Electrons are something that the body never really had an expectation of having to store. Uh, because so what happens is, uh, the sun is constantly blasting electrons into space, along with all the other things it radiates out. And the electrons come on the solar wind, and then they hit our atmosphere, and they charge the atmosphere up. And then when the differential between the atmosphere and the earth becomes great enough, we get lightning. And the lightning blasts of the earth and helps charge the earth back up. So if you are living in a kind of animal lifestyle, you know, meaning no shoes and no house, uh, as an animal, you would be in continuous contact with the earth, you would have a continuous uh, supply of electrons. And when we started altering our lifestyles, meaning we um, started moving into climates that we didn't have the body fur to handle, right? So, I mean, living in cold climates is not natural to humans. We can certainly do it and we can adapt, but it's not natural to us. And so now we start doing things like wearing lots of clothing and now the, you know, then the ground is cold or hard. We start, you know, wearing shoes, you know, and in the beginning, the shoes aren't a big deal as much because they're made out of leather, but they're starting to insulate us from the earth a little bit, especially when the leather's dry. And then we fast forward to where we are now and we're wearing rubber shoes, walking on carpets. When was the last time I put my bare feet on ground? You know, it's pretty rare. So the body doesn't have that free access to uh, an abundant so supply of electrons. And it doesn't really know how to handle that. So, you know, think of the bear. When the bear runs out of, you know, the bear can store food as fat, but it has this backup thing, which is called hibernation. And it says, okay, I don't know if this fat's going to last long enough. I'm going to sleep. So one of the things that happens to people when they run out of electrons is they kind of go into a quasi hibernation state. They just don't have enough power to run their system anymore. And so they say, all right, well, let's just turn everything down. 
And a person could experience that as depression or fatigue or any number of things. So what do we do with this situation, right? You know, we were meant to be getting electrons through the, the ground, through our feet, um, through the air we breathe and through the food we eat. And so with the exception of the electric eel, I don't think any other animals know how to store electrons. <laughs> right. That's a neat trick, right? I think that'd be pretty cool. So what do we do then? So the, the main way we're meant to get electrons is through our feet. And, you know, I went to acupuncture school for a little while. Uh, I didn't stay in it because it turns out I don't like needles, which is probably something I should have thought about before I went to <laughs> acupuncture school. But, you know, I was in my early 20s. What did I know? Anyway, so if you study acupuncture, uh, you know, what you find is it, it's kind of like an irrigation system that for something they call chi. Well, you know, what is chi? Well, I think chi are electrons. And I think what the way the system is designed is when you put your feet on the ground, the electrons go into the meridian points, kidney one at the bottom of the foot, and then from there go into uh, the irrigation system, which is the meridians, and then feeds the internal organs. And then the organs have the electrons they need to run their operations. And uh, what ends up happening is not only don't we get those electrons from the ground, but we're actually running our electrical systems backwards. Um, it's not that we're short circuited, um, it's we're, we're running in reverse. Now, the human body is incredibly good at absorbing electrons, but that also means we're incredibly good at losing electrons because it's a two-way street. So we can pull electrons from almost any surface, but if that same surface has a lower charge than we do, then we can lose the electrons. It goes both ways. There are very few substances that will actually give us electrons. Um, or maybe, you know, there's some natural substances, but almost anything you put against the skin, especially if it's synthetic, will strip electrons off some things faster than others. So, you know, when we're walking around in our synthetic blend clothes and with rubber soled shoes on synthetic carpets, what we're really doing is just ripping electrons out of our body from the internal organs, from our bloodstream, out the meridians, out our feet, into our skin, into the environment. And we're constantly bleeding electrons out when we should be sucking them in. And this doesn't just take place with our skin, although that's a major part of it. Um, the other thing is the other two ways we talked about it is what's through air and food. So the food we eat, if it were raw, would be full of electrons uh, because all raw life has lots of electrons in it. Now, cooking food was a, an amazing technology for humans. And if you follow the evolutionary model, and I'm not saying that's what happened, but if you do, then when you cook food, not only do you uh, kill the parasites and the bacteria um, and whatever else is on there. So that's less of a load for the body to have to deal with. So we have more energy. Um, it also makes the food much more absorbable. Uh, if you give a dog or a cat a choice between raw and cooked meat, it'll always choose the cooked meat because cooked matter is, is just by nature more broken down. And especially for plants, because we don't have the cellulase enzyme to break plant, plant matter down. Uh, we don't have four different stomachs. So, you know, um, while there's a lot of things you can get from vegetables, you get orders of magnitude more when you cook them. Now, mind you, I think raw food's fantastic. And I did raw food for quite some time, but you won't get the absorption you're going to get out of cooked food. Now, there's a lot of things you lose with cooked food. There's a lot of amino acids that get destroyed at relatively low temperatures, like below 110. Um, it denatures proteins. It, it causes the oils to change. So cooking food has its own issues. I'm more of a fan of slow cooked food, but in any case, not to get off topic, um, when we cook our food, or if all we eat is cooked food, then rather than getting electrons from our food into our digestive system and then into our bloodstream, it's going in reverse. Our body then has to donate electrons from our intestines into the food so it can properly be absorbed uh, and, and properly be metabolized. So there's another electrode system going in reverse. And finally, with the air. So you've probably heard of these negative ion generators, um, you know, that are there to put an, a negative electron, electrical charge on the air. And, uh, you know, they are recreating something in nature, which would be waterfalls and, and waves crashing in the ocean and lightning, you know, lightning strikes. 
uh, things that are going to put a negative charge in the air you breathe. That's why one of the reasons it feels so great to get near a waterfall and especially in the ocean, not only are you getting all the electrons to your skin, but the crashing waves, it's in the air, it's great. So in a natural world, uh, about a hundred years ago, I think, according to Japanese researchers, um, air was mostly negative, right? I mean, we still actually need a little bit of a positive charge because positively charged air uh, oxygen molecules actually have a metabolic use in the body, but we should be mostly negative. The air should be, I think, uh, five to four uh, negative to positive. At least that's what it was a hundred years ago. The air we breathe in now is four to five negative to positive. It's more positively charged. One of the things that negatively charged air does is it binds to positively charged particulate matter in the air, and then it drops it out of, uh, you know, it combines with it and it uh, kind of lets it stick to something and drops it out. So the air is no longer negative, uh, no longer has a negative net charge to it. Uh, in, in the balance of things, because the air we breathe is so polluted, most of it's being wasted, or not wasted, most of it's getting used up dealing with the polluted air. So it's the same thing now with our lungs. Rather than the air we breathe donating electrons to our lungs and keeping our lungs healthy and clean and vital and moving all the junk out of them, uh, our lungs have to donate electrons to the air we breathe. And so our lungs um, start getting toxic. So if you look at the lungs of older people at an autopsy, and there's a reason why they're darker, especially if they've been smoking, things are sticking inside their lungs, all those tars and all those things. Well, you know, the, the, the nature of anything adhesive is a lack of electrons. That's what makes things stick together. At a molecular level, you get down small, uh, when two things are sticking together, it's because there's not enough electrons to go around and they're both arguing over who gets to keep them. So, you know, when people are, are, have these dark lungs from years of, you know, brief smoking cigarettes or living in a city. And I think a city life is equivalent to a half a pack of cigarettes a day, something like that. You know, they don't have the, the positively charged particulate matter is now sticking in their lungs and they don't have the electrons to loosen them up and to get them out, which would happen if you had, you know, you know, the body has the ability to, to clear the lungs out with surfactants and with cilia and, you know, it'll, it'll eventually dredge it all up through, through phlegm and mucus, but it has to, it has to be um, liquid enough. It has to not be sticky. Otherwise you're never getting it out. So what happened is that all three of our electron systems are going in reverse. Now the what's going through our skin, what's getting in our lungs and what's getting into our food. And so what I thought we would talk about is, um, what happens when we get low on electrons and how we could turn that around. And yeah. So tell us, how do we do that? How do we go about raising our voltage? Uh, apart from some of the things you mentioned, getting out in nature, going to the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what are some, and eating raw foods, what are some other ways that we can raise our voltage? You're really going to need a machine to do it. And I'm sorry to say that. Um, you know, I, I, used, I was hoping the grounding would do it and it's not. And, um, let me explain why and, and what happens. Um, we're going to have to use, you know, have to fight fire with fire, right? Science got us into this mess. Unfortunately, you know, science is going to have to get us out. Uh, it would have been great if there was some really great technique to do, but unless you're living, you know, um, by the ocean and you go in every day, I don't think there's going to be enough electrons in anything available naturally to undo what has happened. And let me explain why that I think that's the case. So, all right, what happens when we get low on electrons? So uh, crystals form in the body um, and we don't detoxify well because you need an electrical charge on the voltage of each cell to uh, pull the nutrition in and to push the toxins out. And the circulation gets sticky. Like if you take a, a balloon and you rub it against your shirt, it'll stick to the wall, right? That's because you've pulled the electrons off the balloon, and now the balloon and the wall are fighting over the same electrons, and it gets stuck to the wall. And the same thing happens to blood cells. If you look at red blood cells at the capillary level, you'll see the red blood cells get stuck there. They can, they can spend you know, a minute or two there because they're sticking like balloons to the, to the wall because they don't have enough of a charge to move properly. But let's, let's focus on crystals because this is where the detox part comes in. And this is going to explain why uh, I don't think grounding will actually work uh, initially. So uh, your 
probably familiar with a condition called gout. This is where uric acid um, from urines, uh, and some people say from fungi, but um, forms crystals in the joints, initially the big toes, very painful experience. And this was one of the reasons why people used to go to uh, hot springs because they would also be high, often be high in sulfur or uh, compounds, and that would help uh, make these crystals more soluble and you could beat them out. So, uh, you know, the ancient healing springs were often due to uh, helping to deal with crystals. Uh, more recently, you, uh, you've probably heard about oxalate crystals. That's been definitely making the rounds, and it's good that it has. Oxalates are uh, elements found in plants, and the plants use them for structure and for transport and, and holding on to uh, nutritional elements. And it's a little tricky, you know, trying to figure out what foods have oxalates in them because uh, you can find three different analyses of the same food, and some of them are high, and some are medium, and some are low. So what that tells us is it's not just the species of plant that may or may not have an affinity for oxalates, like you know spinach is incredibly high, um, but also the conditions in which they're grown. Uh, perhaps uh, the quality of the soil or the exposure to certain toxins may stress the plant out. And so you may see one, you know, a fig from one tree with very low oxalates and from another very high. So it's really, you, you can't, you can try to minimize oxalates in your diet by avoiding the things that are really high just right off the bat, you know, spinach and soy and rhubarb and things like this, buckwheat. Uh, but even that isn't enough because theoretically any food, if it's grown in, and then I'm not sure what the conditions are that does it, can trigger uh, oxalate growth in the plant. In any case, Oxalates are another thing that show up in the joints, uh, in the body. And why are crystals forming? Let's talk about one more talk, uh, type of crystal, and then I'll explain why they're forming, how they're related to electrons and how you get them out. When someone gets, say, mercury or lead in their body, it doesn't stay as elemental mercury or lead. It's going to bind, it's going to connect to something and, and create a salt. So for instance, mercury and lead can both bond to phosphate or sulfate both of which are abundant in our bodies. Um, phosphate and sulfate are bound to, uh, you know, the calcium and potassium and so magnesium and so forth to make bones and nerves and connective tissue. And they balance pH and detoxify and exchange oxygen. So we've always got sulfate and phosphate around in our bodies, you know, assuming we're eating a decent diet. And so because of that, if the mercury or lead get in, then they're going to form uh, mercury phosphate, mercury sulfate, lead phosphate, lead sulfate. And this is a challenge because we want to get these metals out, but once they crystallize, it gets a little trickier. Why would these things be in our body in the first place? Uh, well, um, if you go uh, watch the movie Biosludged that Mike Adams made, if you've, have you seen that film? Oh my God. Um, so... Uh, all, all, the sewer water, the sewer contains not only everything that's flushed on the toilet, but everything that all the industry makes. So that's all the chemicals, all the, all the bacteria, all the toxins. Now, uh, if we were clever like the Swiss, we'd incinerate it first, but, even, uh, but we don't. Um, but, and even if we did, that would still leave the metals behind. So all of this stuff gets pelletized basically or, or dried out and then sold as fertilizer and it goes on our food supply. So... Uh, every flushed toilet and every bit of, or unless you're by the rivers or the oceans, and all of the affluent toxic waste coming out of the industrial plants gets in the sewer, gets on our farmland, because they'll say, hey, here's some free fertilizer, because indeed, you know, urine and feces will generate um, fertilizer if that's all that was in it. But, uh, you know, all the drugs and all the other things, that's a whole other ball of wax. But all this stuff gets on the food, gets into the food chain because it's all being dumped onto our, onto our farmland. And so, you know, we've got all this stuff that we're exposed to, but getting back to it. So now we've got, say, some mercury and some lead in the body. And the body has the natural ability to get rid of these things, but um, they crystallize and, you know, they kind of connect together like Lego blocks or like little magnets. And once a crystal gets over seven nanometers, which is pretty small, uh, uh, so once it gets over one twenty thousandth of the diameter of a human hair, it becomes 10,000 times less soluble. So once these toxic crystals get in our body, uh, whether they're you know, metal crystals or um, crystals like oxalate and uric acid or the, the other 15 crystals that we tend to find in the body, 
if they get to a certain size, it's really hard to get rid of them. Once they're there, that size, they're really not very soluble. And certainly you can use chelators, but you know, imagine if you've got this crystal like this, right? Well, you, the chelator can only go to the access the surface of the crystal. It can't get to what's inside the crystal. So it's a very slow process. Uh, and the strength that that chelator has to have to clear up, to pull something away from a, a fully completed crystal is a lot, it's a lot more difficult when the crystal is larger. So what we really need to do is we need to break these crystals up, get them below, get them sub seven nanometers so that they become soluble again. So we can pee them out, so we can chelate them out, so forth and so on. So we have to break up the crystals and I'll tell you how to do that. But first, let me explain what's happening as to kind of why they're forming because it's connected to the electrons here. And I know we're kind of going all over the place. It's just- a No, I love how I don't have to ask you any questions. You just are just flowing. <laughs> Okay. I'm making my job, out. making my job really easy. <laughs> well, do you have any questions so far? I do not. I do. I'm just enjoying listening. Okay. So <laughs> imagine you have three neighbors and they each, they each have an RV. You know, these are the three little pigs, right? And one's smarter than the next. And okay. So the, the first guy or gal, they, you know, they, they use their, their RV for the winter, uh, for the summer. And then the fall, um, they just park it. And when this person comes back in the spring to go on a trip, that battery is dead. He puts it on a charger and it's not taking a charge and that's it. He needs a new battery. Okay. Let's, uh, have his next door neighbor had an RV last year, did the same thing. And so he was a little smarter. And so what he did is he, uh, disconnected the battery. He came back in the spring and, uh, and then, but the battery was dead, but not as completely dead because it was only self-discharging, you know, at a few percent a month or whatever. And he put it on a battery charger and recovered it. The battery was never as good as it was before, but it was good enough to do his trip. And then the third person, you know, with a, th a third RV, that family's had the RV the longest and they've gone through the first two bits of trouble. And not only did they disconnect the battery, they put it on a trickle charger. And when they got ready to go uh, in the spring, that battery, was in perfect shape, ready to go, good to go, right? So we have three technologies. We, you know, the, the three different people, the RV, one let their battery get destroyed. It had to be replaced. One didn't get too badly destroyed and one was perfectly fine. What was going on the battery is that the lead was sulfating and forming crystals. And, you know, this is the same thing that happens in the cell phone battery. Um, if, you know, you, over time, especially if you don't keep that battery properly charged, it can't hold a charge anymore because crystals are forming inside the battery. And it's those crystals that are decreasing the battery's ability to hold a charge and to, uh, to receive a charge. So when we get low on electrons, not only do we form crystals, like all those toxic metal crystals and all those other crystals in the body, which are an issue because now they're very hard to get rid of, but the presence of the crystals themselves make it more difficult for us to get a charge again, which is, so it's um, a negative feedback loop, right? It's a vicious circle. Once the, once a battery starts getting uh, crystallized, it's very difficult. Now we can't be like the, uh, the family with the, the damaged battery and just go out and get a new battery because we have 30 trillion cells on our body and each one of them acts like a little battery. Right. What those, what that charge does is it's, it's pulling in charged elements, which are nutritional and pushing out charged elements that are waste products or toxins. So we can't replace all 30 trillion cells. So we have to figure out a way to do that. And, you know, the, the military has a similar problem. You know, they might have a million dollar battery on their nuclear submarine they can't allow that battery to just be replaced. It's too expensive. They have to have the ability to recover damaged batteries. And, you know, it's been figured out. You use voltage spikes, the same kind of, and, and that's what's happening with the lightning. The lightning's like a voltage spike, you know, kind of decrystallizing the earth, so, so to say, like charging and healing the earth up. So we would need something similar to that. So you've heard of grounding. Grounding is the trickle charge. Yeah, but because the, ground, grounding is not enough for a lot of people because uh, because of EMF, electromagnetic fields from wireless and internet, and maybe I'll ask you about that in a second, but because of that creating this positive charge on people, just grounding by itself isn't enough to, to correct that impact 
that so many of us are, are dealing with today. Yeah, especially when 5G starts going over the power lines and then 5G is everywhere. So what happens is all of our electronics run on current more than voltage, right? You can make voltaged engines, engines that run on voltage, but current is much more efficient and voltage is a pain to work with because it likes to shoot out of wires and, and cause all sorts of problems. So our electronic world is based on current, right? I mean, of course there's voltage with current. Of course they're both happening, but it's based on uh, running things with more current than with voltage. And the challenge with that is anytime you have current running across a wire, you create an electron vacuum and it'll pull electrons out of the environment. Uh, so when you have all these people that are getting, you know, like when they had the big uh, electrical towers over the schools and all the kids got leukemia, well, then they came around and said, oh, well, it can't be the towers because look at all these cows underneath them and they're not getting leukemia. I'm like, yeah, well, the cows are barefoot, right? So all the electrons that were being pulled out of them by the wires were getting replaced by the earth. The kids were not barefoot. The kids were, were in with rubber sole shoes. So, you know, there's a bit of hubris when it comes to um, science, you know, a, a lot, you know, the problem is they'll say, well, that's anecdotal. If you can't explain the principle by which you think it's happening, it's not science. And that's absurd, you know? If those kids are getting leukemia, and they are, you don't just leave them in that environment while you try to figure out how it's happening. You take them out. And, you know, if you can figure it out, great. But, you know, you don't make your make kids into guinea pigs. So now we know, and, you know, how many kids ended up, you know, getting sick that were under those towers because um, the politicians and the business people said, well, no, 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 that can't happen, and here's why. Like, no, it did happen, you know? precautionary principle. In any case, so right now, you know, I put my hands on the keyboard, electrons are being pulled out of me. You know, I grab a, a phone and I, it's a wired phone, it's being pulled out of me. Everything like the, the, the wireless headset you're wearing right now, you know, if we could see electrons, we would see electrons leaving your body, going down those and going out to the earth. So, and I'm not saying live a Luddite existence, don't avoid electronics. There are some things you can do, you know, um, you, you can make your, your sleeping environment uh, electron friendly, right? Uh, you could, you know, turn off the breaker going to your bedroom at night. And if there's a cell tower um, and you know the direction it's at, put up uh, EMF protective film, even if it's just a couple of sheets of aluminum foil on that side of the wall. So at least you're protected from that. But yeah, there's, we're, we're being drained by every electrical device that we are not only touching, but are even near in terms of electrons. So that's, uh, that's why grounding doesn't work because we're more like the person in the first RV, the let the battery die, right? And now if you stick a trickle charger on a battery that's died, well, that's not going to do anything. Even putting a trick, you know, even putting a trickle charger in a battery that's just gotten low won't do anything. A trickle charger only works for a battery that was high to begin with, and then it maintains it. So grounding is if you are high in electrons to begin with, It'll keep you there. Meaning if you've spent your whole life on the beach and barefoot on the ground, that's all you'll ever need. If you haven't, and we haven't, then the battery has gone down and the trickle charger won't be enough. So the question is, you know, where are we on that next level? Are we number two or number three? Are we the battery that's died but can be recharged? Or do we actually have to go in and recover a completely dead battery? And so um, what I did is uh, I built a machine that would do those two things that uh, would act as a charger to charge a low battery and a decrystallizer to recover a dead battery. Cause that's what you have to do. You have to break up all the crystals uh, so that the, the, the machinery can work again. So when we started talking about, and now we come back full circle, we started talking about all these toxic metals and all these crystals, whether they're from <laughs> metals or from oxalates or from uric acid or what they're from, you know, not only is that a sign that we're low on voltage, um, but it's also a cause of further poor voltage. So we want to break those crystals up, not only because we want to detoxify those toxins, but because we also want to be able to receive the charge. So, uh, gosh, it took me maybe two to three weeks of breaking up crystals with this machine I made, which was based not all that much differently from what they used to recover multi-million dollar batteries. It took me about two to three weeks to uh, get the crystals out. 
mostly out. I mean, did you have a lot of detox symptoms? Because there's toxins yeah, well, in I those mean, crystals. I, right. So um, an incredible amount of sludge came out in my urine. You know, it was completely cloudy. I actually passed a few kidney stones uncomfortably <laughs> as a result because I, I I did it too quickly. So don't do it quickly. You know, if you take you if you have fifty years of crystals form uh, formed in the body. You can take 50 days to get it out. You know, that's, that's, that's not, no rush. Um, so definitely you want to look to see if your urine's getting cloudy and then, you know, slow down, drink a little more water. The other thing that I found was uh, after about two weeks, I think, I think I shared this with you, um, I no longer needed to wear wool socks to bed. And I had had to wear wool socks to bed for, you know, uh, since I was in my 30s, my feet were always cold, even in the summertime. So I kind of figured the decrystallizing took you know, two to three weeks to get the bulk of it out. And then I was just kind of recharging. And then that took about 18 months where I was constantly craving it. So, you know, how do you know when you're done, right? You know, if you start recharging the body, how do you know? Well, you, you can look to see if there's crystals in the urine. And if you have the ability, you can put it to a centrifuge and <clears throat> put it under a microscope slide and actually see a bunch of crystals coming out of you. The other thing to do is just see how you feel. Uh, it took about 18 months, like I said, before I wasn't craving it every day. You know, now, a year or two later, if I don't use it for a week, um, I don't feel bad. I certainly feel nice and relaxed when I do get on it for a few minutes. Uh, but yeah, that's how long it took, took me to recover it. Um, you know, there's a lot of electrical devices out there. A lot of questions people will say is, well, you know, what about a Rife machine or a multi-wave oscillator or a TENS machine or all these other things or some of the versions of the Russian Skanar, um, Mr. Tennant has one, a biomodulator, so forth and so on. Uh, there are a lot of great healing devices, but with the exception of one other unit similar to mine in Japan, they're all removing electrons when they do the other good things they do, right? So Rife machines are like electrical uh, antibiotics and antivirals. All these devices have very interesting effects, but they're all working on current, they're all pulling electrons out. And one of the ways you can tell is any unit that has two electrodes, right? A TENS unit has two electrodes, a biomodulator has two electrodes, a handheld rifle machine has two electrodes. <clears throat> that means the energy is coming in one electrode and not the other. So it's not designed to give you a net increase of electrons. To get a net increase of electrons, you'd need a machine that had one electrode and was designed to positively pressurize your body with electricity or the, with voltage. So that's a hint. If you have a machine where there's two electron electrodes that are being that are going on your body, or it's something that's radiating onto you, it's stripping you of electrons. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. I mean, I use lots of machines that will strip electrons from me. I just make sure afterwards to put the electrons back in. Okay, but that's really, really interesting. That's a really good distinction because uh, you know I've also used a number of devices and, and also water. This uh, product called Wata that I've used to feed my body electrons and whatnot. And um, but uh, there's that differentiation where you also you've got to decrystallize your body as well because we also have you know our, in our fascia we have this like crystalline matrix where a lot of the bioenergetic messages and communication happens in our body. And there's, there's problems when you have, uh, you know, this crystallization or dehydration or even scars that will all kind of block your bioenergetic commun communication in your body. So I love that you're making this distinction there to help people kind of, you know, crystallize that, that kind mm -hmm. of like idea in their mind about the kind of the, the process people to go through to get their body communicating again. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting research about the crystal forms of water in the body and the uh, cells acting as a, a liquid crystal display in terms of how they function. I think there's a book called The Rainbow and the Worm that talks about that. Uh, so as an example, um, we had one woman who used the machine and within a few days, she calls me up. She's got a full body rash or at least chest and back. And she had that for three days and then she decided to go and take some, um, I guess some steroids or anti-inflammatories or something. And then the rash went away. And when she was done with that experience, her fibromyalgia was 85% gone. And what a shame because my thought is, had she not suppressed the junk coming out of her skin with the drugs and let it gone on for an additional day or two, it might very well have gotten the last 
of her situation resolved. Uh, but she didn't. But that was a uh, you know definitely an interesting thing to see. Uh, you know something uh, a situation a woman had had for years that was sort of calcified into all sorts of different protocols getting resolved in a few days. So you know we talked about getting electrons in the body through three sources through uh, food what we eat. Uh, through the air we breathe and through our skin. So, you know, the machine we've made, uh, the electron charger is designed, you know, for you to put your feet on. You can also put it on various parts of your body. One thing to be aware of is uh, parasites can't stand electricity, or at least they can't stand electrons. So if you're squeamish, um, when you first start using it, don't look on the toilet. Um, you may very well be passing some worms and while most parasites are um, microscopic, some of them <clears throat> are inches long, and uh, you know you may see them come out. Uh, the thing about electricity is, so you know, parasites. There are definitely some parasites that are uh, aggressive, but a lot of them are also opportunistic. Uh, a lot of them are just looking for compost, and so they're looking for dead matter so that they can be doing their part of the life cycle. And when our tissue is really low in voltage, it looks, it tastes, it smells like dead tissue. So it decides to set up shop. When you raise the voltage, it doesn't want to be here anymore because it wants to be in a compost pile and that it leaves. So you might very well see some live wriggling worms in the toilet. And if that's going to throw you just first week you're using the electron charger, don't look, just flush. <laughs> um, so how do we, how else can we get these electrons into us? So uh, one, when I was thinking about the, the food and the, uh, the air, I said, well, you know, how can we get it into our food again? And so what I did is I found a way that if you take a Vitamix blender and I can show you how to do that, if you, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, you just attach the electron charger at, at a certain point at the base where it makes contact with the drive shaft that connects to the blades. And now the blades are electrified. So if you pour, uh, you know, some lethicin, a tablespoon of lethicin in and some water into a blender along with whatever else you're making as a smoothie and then blend it with the electron charger on, the liposomes are going to get blasted in, sorry, the lethicin will get blasted into liposomes, which are tiny little spheres that will hold an electric charge. And then that's a way of having like a liquid battery. You drink it in and now you are, in, in the same way that you can't get enough electrons through your feet from grounding because of what's happened and you you better to have a machine pump it in at high pressure. It would be hard to eat enough food to undo what years and years and years of cooked food have done. Um, but if you make an electronic smoothie uh, and you do that for a couple of weeks, you may be able to rebuild the electrical charge in your gut properly. One interesting thing that I had been told by um, a person who was using it is he said, wow, I don't really need to wash the, the blender out afterwards. It comes out really clean. Usually there's, you know, all this, you know, stuff, oils and stuff stuck to the side. No, it just rinses completely clean. I'm like, yes, that's because it's full of electrons because when things are full of electrons, everything flows, things are more soluble. Nothing gets stuck behind and left it stuck and sticky. So toxicity and can be thought of as just something stuck somewhere and you can't get out. So when you raise the electrical charge of the body, everything flows better, you know, and then the intestines aren't like a you know, an old blender, uh, you know, it's, it's not sticky and slimy. Everything is clean and moving through uh, the way it should be. And then the last thing we did is just said, well, what about the lungs? You know, there are a lot of people who um, they're living in um, cities or they're, they've got a history of smoking. So uh, I made this device. It's got a little reaction chamber in it. You plug the electron charger in, you breathe through, and it's uh, charging the air as you breathe it. Electricity, I think, is a is an underestimated player in the detox uh, game in the detox world. Uh, it's overlooked, and there are a lot of things we can certainly do to detox. You know, but you'll detox better if you have enough electrons to do it. Um, if you have enough electrons, then the toxins can get pushed out of the cell, and the crystals will be smaller because you'll hit them with voltage. If you hit it with a voltage spike you'll shatter the crystals into little tiny pieces, hopefully sub seven nanometers. And now you're able to detox faster. Uh, I, everything works better when you have electrons. I mean, as an example, you know, the one of the biggest classes of supplements out there are antioxidants. And everyone thinks antioxidants give you electrons, kind of, 
um, antioxidants transport electrons. Antioxidants, uh, you know, depending on whether they're water or fat soluble and their shape, go to different parts of their body and will donate an electron. And then they are expecting to get recharged, write that in there and don't donate another electron. And they're expecting to get recharged a million, a billion times a second. I mean, the reactions happen really fast, right? So if we take a bunch of antioxidants, then we have the electrons on them and it gets used one time and it donates, donates that one electron and then no more because there's not a surplus of electrons in the body. So while taking antioxidants is great for you, you could get by with a thousandth of the amount of antioxidants if you had more, more electrons because you wouldn't need as much and then they would be constantly recycled and, and, and uh, donated to the body. It's sort of like, you know, imagine you have 10,000 trucks coming into a city with food, but each truck only has one loaf of bread. That is nowhere near as efficient as 100 trucks coming in, each with 10,000 loaves of bread every, you know, and, and constantly getting refilled, you know, all over, over and over and over again. Oh, no, I guess I didn't do that right. If you had, if you had a hundred trucks, okay, I got it. If you had a hundred mopeds, each with a loaf of bread and each moped was constantly going back and bringing another loaf of bread. There we go. That's the right analogy. And anyway, the idea is antioxidants work by transporting and shuttling electrons and you have to have the electrons there in the first place for them. So, um, it's a, it's an overlooked thing. You know, the, the body's figured out how to deal with certain ways in which we've changed, right? Um, we moved away from the sunny tropics, so our skin got lighter. We eat more cooked food, so you'll take a look at the pancreases of modern humans are, much, are, are a lot bigger um, than, you know, uh, previous, because uh, we've got other issues going on with the kind of foods we eat. I think people's livers are getting more enlarged as a general rule, uh, because they've got more of a toxic load. So the body has a a degree to compensate, but not only shouldn't we be asking it to do that, there are some things it just can't compensate for, right? Okay, it can compensate for low electrons by just making a person exhausted. Not the best compensation. I mean, it works, it keeps them alive, but uh, you know, a lot of the things that we're dealing with as symptoms are really compensation strategies of the body. And um, if you try to, right, so now you got somebody who might be low on energy and they think, oh, I, I'm going to drink a cup of coffee, to try to compensate for that. And yes, they get more energy and, but now they're burning out their adrenals and they're forcing their body to use up electrons even faster that they don't even have. And so now something else happens. So we can end up going from compensation to compensation. What we really need to do is kind of look at how the body is designed, look at how science has altered the world we live in and try to figure a lifestyle that takes those into consideration and brings us back to some kind of homeostasis. Yeah, fantastic. You know, this show is really illuminating. I know for a lot of people, it's, it's going to be like that missing piece of the puzzle that they've been looking for, that they need to try. Um, so Spencer, I thank you so much for coming on the show. And tell us where we can get your electron charger and what your website is. Oh, sure. So if you uh, are interested in the, the stuff we make, we are at Remedy Link. R-E-M-E-D-Y-L-I-N-K dot com. The electron charger's there. And we have a, a video page that kind of goes in, into the science of it a lot more in depth for those that like to get into uh, the sciencey stuff more deeply. And, and, you know, thank you so much for having me on. I, I appreciate it. You know, you um, definitely have taught me so much uh, about how the, the body works and, uh, you know, watching your podcasts and the, the amazing people you have on it's been illuminating for me, you know, it's uh, because you can't really go to school to learn these things. As you know, Wendy, there's even you go to a naturopathic school and osteopathic school. Um, you know, a friend of mine was going to naturopathic school and was told, okay, well, you may have to do things in the clinic. You don't like, like uh, give vaccines. And she's like, Oh, I can't do that. Like, so, you know, they're, they're becoming traditional, you know, in, in a lot of ways, the, some of these schools that started out as alternative are kind of being, brought into the fold of modern medicine. So it's really people like yourself, Wendy, that are connecting the individual researchers with the general public that are really allowing uh, us all to figure out what's going on in ways you know we could never do on our own. I mean, 
there's so much knowledge and so many things to learn. So thank you so much for helping make all this available for all of us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I mean, I, I know when I first started out learning about this stuff, it was just so disjointed and there weren't really any, when I first started over 10 years ago, there weren't really any courses mm. about detox or maybe one, a, hand, a handful. There's a lot more now, which is great. But even then, you know, there are a few thousand dollars. So I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, find all these experts from around the world and kind of just do a, a download of their brain and their knowledge to kind of figure figure this out, figure this puzzle out of, you know, how do we detox the body and how do these toxins uh, dramatically affect our health? Because I really think that toxins are the number one primary driver of disease today. I firmly believe that and try to educate the public about that. So thank you for contributing to that, to the conversation here. And everyone, thanks so much for listening to the Myers Detox podcast. It's just a, really a, a joy for me every week to bring you this information and help you, you know, put the pieces of your, your health together because you deserve to feel good. Uh, and and you, I, I want to help you uh, find a way to do that. So thanks for tuning in. I'm Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com, and I'll talk to you guys very soon. The Myers Detox Podcast is created and hosted by Wendy Myers. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Wendy Myers and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.